As you prepare hearts and minds to go to the Word this morning, I want to encourage you to grab your Bibles. Um, I'm going to be reading a few passages of Scripture, and I would love for you to read along with me. Now, we're going to pick up where we left off on last week. I will be picking up the series about trust resulting in obedience. So if you missed last week's message, make sure you go to our YouTube channel to listen to that so you can be brought up to speed because we're going to be jumping right in the middle uh, today as we look to God's Word. So before I jump into the text and before I review a little bit to bring you up to speed, let's look to God for a word of prayer um, that the good Lord would just move and have his way in our midst this morning. So bow your heads with me. We're going to pray, then we're going to dive in the Word. Father, in the name of Jesus, you are an awesome God. You are a wonderful God. You are a magnificent and a phenomenal God. So as we go to your word this morning, I say this every week and I'll say it again. Felix dies so you can take residence on the throne of my life. I empty myself. Allow me say something to say something today that would just motivate a person to have a deeper level of trust in you and to know you in that way. So we give our hearts and our time to you this morning that you would be glorified. It is in your name we pray and thank you. Amen and amen. Now, before I go deep into the message this morning, let me back up a little bit just to bring you up to speed on what we talked about. We've been studying the story of Abraham in Genesis chapter 22, so you can grab your Bibles and begin your journey there. But here's the first thing I shared with you last week. We talked about that we should trust God, not his vehicle or the vehicle of promise. And what we were making reference to there last week is the fact that God had promised Abraham that he would make his name great and he would bless him and make his descendants as the sand of the earth. But God was going to do that through Isaac. And so when we talked about the vehicle of promise, we were making reference to Isaac being that thing through which God was going to do what God said he was going to do. And the call of that point, number one, is keep the focus always on God, not the vehicle, not the Isaacs, not the things in your life, because God will call you. Uh, He will test you. He will test your trust in him based on that thing. So when we looked at one hey, it flows right in line with that, right? Here's what we said last week. God will test your trust in him. That's very, very important. And we're going to see this a little later in the lesson this morning, that sometimes later, here's how I'm going to say it, God will test me and God will test you. So, and then here's the second thing we saw with two, with 1B, that God will test our trust in his transforming ability. You're going to hear a lot more about that this morning. Let me tell you where I'm going or what I meant. Prior to Abraham being tested, his name was Abram, and God changed his name to Abraham. You're going to see the same thing again. Her name, his wife, was Sarai. God changed her name to Sarah, right? Look at my story. Before my conversion, I had an old name which symbolized the old character, and God changed that to the new character. The same would be true in you. So here's how 2 Corinthians says it. If any person is in Christ, they are what? A new creation. The old has gone and the new has come. So when the transformation takes place, God's going to test that new person to see if the new person really trusts him at the new level. And that's what the transforming ability of God is. So we saw that. And then we're going to really dig into this today. God will test our trust in his word versus the vehicle of promise. Here's what that looks like. If God says, I will bless you through a certain thing and the thing comes, are we going to focus so much on the thing that we take our eyes off of the God who said he was going to bless us? So the call is to always keep our eyes on Jesus and never take our eyes off of him. Here's what item D was, right? God will test our ability to trust and follow him without the details. My goodness. So you see why you want to hear that word. This is me. 
When God calls me to do something, I want to fast and I want to pray. And then I'm fasting and praying, but I'm saying to this God, I'm saying this to God, show me how, show me where, show me when, give me one, two, three, four, five, six. And like Abraham, God just called him, take your son, your only son Isaac, and go to a place that I'm going to show you with no details. And Abraham obeys. Can we trust God like that? Can we depend on God like that to get to where God is taking us? Here was point number two, and we're going to hang our hats here and talk about it. Let me just give you a little preview into that. Number two was this. Our obedience is an indicator of our level of trust in God. In other words, when God speaks, whether we obey or not is an indicator of how much we really trust God. I'm going to read the text in a little while. Look at what 2A said last week, right? Trust in God. Here's what it means. Quick response to God's word in our lives. So in other words, if God says, give this up, or if God says, give that up, your response time dictates your level of trust in God. This is very, very important because God will say to me, Felix, stop this or stop that. And I'll keep playing with it for a little while. And what that's really saying to me is that I don't trust God like that. What it's really saying to you when we hang on to things that God calls us to give up is that we really don't trust God like that, right? And I love I loved this next one, 2B. Here's what it says. Time on the journey should never impact our trust and obedience to God. This is important. The time on the journey. Abraham, take your son, your only son Isaac, and offer him on a place that I'm going to show you. And lock into this. He had to walk. Abraham had to walk with Isaac and his servants for three whole days getting to the place of sacrifice, right? And he had a lot of time to think. He had a lot of time to reflect. But here's the point that we were making in 2B, right? The time on the journey, those three days, did not cause Abraham to look back. He had learned some things about God. And you're going to hear that this morning as we talk about that as we go in the text. So don't let the time on the journey cause you to dis obey God. So let's let's dive in this let's dive in this morning. Now 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 let me say this, right? I know some of you are probably troubled because you look at Abraham in Genesis chapter 22 and here's what you're saying if you're human of Abraham. Wow. That's amazing that that guy could could respond to God like that and offer his only son, Isaac. I'm going to pick up in verse 5 of chapter 22, right? We're going, to, we're going to get there, but I want to lay some foundation. Now, you're seeing that, and here's what you're saying. That's him. I'm not there yet. I don't have that level of trust in God. And so what that does is sometimes we look at his journey. We look at Abraham's walk and Abraham's journey, and you're hearing me say to you, that our trust should result in obedience. And it's easy to want to conclude, well, I'm not there, so I might as well just disobey. I want to encourage you this morning, and I want to take some time to walk you through some passages of Scripture so that you can see the Abraham that we see in Genesis chapter 22, specifically verse 5, is not the same Abraham of many, many years ago. He was on a journey. He was on a trajectory. He was on a path, and God had him on a path to where we get to 22, verse 5. We see a different guy. We see a guy that God had done a work, that God has uh, completed a work in. So what I want to do today is I want to back up a little bit. I want to show you Abraham's journey because I don't want you to get overwhelmed and I don't want you to hear me say trust God and then you say I don't know what that looks like and then it tempts you to want to quit it tempts you to want to give up it tempts you to not to want to follow God along the way so you're probably asking the question right okay then Pastor Felix how does one go from where they are 
to develop in the level of faith and trust in God that Abraham had so that when God says to me, take Isaac, take the vehicle of promise, your only son, and offer him on, in the land of Moriah on the mountain that I will show you, that you and I can we trust God so much that we can respond immediately to God. So the question is, how do we get there? What's the pathway? What's the journey that we need to take on? And, and this is where I want to, to talk to you this morning. How do we get from no trust to trust that results in obedience, right? So I want us to look at Abraham's process. I want you to look at the Abraham's process in his life because as I said before, Genesis 22 Abraham is a lot different than the earlier Abraham. So back up with me, back up with me to Genesis chapter 17. Um, I'm going to take some time just to read those passages to show you this, this fella by the name of Abraham, how his journey began and how he grew to where he was at the time. And I find this to be extremely helpful because it helped me. So when you go to Genesis chapter 17, look specifically at verse 15. We're going to read verses 15 through 19, and then I'm going to share with you what God was doing in the life of Abraham, right? So let's read with me. Genesis chapter 17, and let's read verse 15. Notice what it says. Notice what it says. I'm in the ESV. It says this. This is the beginning of his journey. So God shows up now, and God makes this covenant. He made this, 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 this promise to bless Abraham. He made this promise to make his name great. But I want you to see Abraham now at the beginning of his journey. Come on, say beginning. Now, let's go to the beginning. Notice what it says. And God said to Abraham, as for Sarai, your wife, you shall not call her name Sarai, but Sarah shall be her name. Look at verse 16. I will bless her, and moreover, I will give you a son by her. I will bless her, and she shall become nations. Kings of people shall come from her. Now look at verse 17. This is very, very Important to see what happens in verse 17. Look at Abraham in verse 17. Then Abraham fell on his face and laughed. My goodness. And he said to himself, Shall a child be born to a man who is a hundred years old? And shall Sarah, who is 90 years old, bear a child? Now, let me go here. Here's what I want you to hear me say. At the beginning of Abraham's journey, God shows up, and, and, and God is speaking directly to Abraham. And look at his faith level. God says, I'm going to bless you, and I'm going to give you a son, and I'm going to do it through the son. And then what we see happening in verse 17, you don't see Abraham saying, yes, God. Here's what you see him doing. You see him laughing at God. You see him doubting God. You see him making excuses on why God cannot do through him what God said he was going to do. You see him saying, I'm 100 years old. You see him saying, my wife is 90 years old. How in the world, God, do you expect to accomplish this thing through us? So what you see happening in verse 17 is, is Abraham at the beginning of his trust. At the beginning of his faith journey, having challenges with God. Why am I saying that? I'm saying that because you need to know it's a ref this, this here is a reflection of where you and I can be at the beginning of our trust journey because we see ourselves in that. God might be saying, I want to do this through you. I want to accomplish this thing. And we're looking at what we have. We're looking at our resources. We're looking at our abilities. We're looking at our education. We're looking at where we live. We're looking at our economic status. And we're saying, God, there is no way. We, we don't trust him at the beginning of the journey. And it's difficult, and this is no different than where Abraham found himself. Now, let me keep reading. Look at, look at verse 17. And Abraham said to God, I like this. Abraham said to God, Oh, that Ishmael 
might live before you. Here is what he's saying um, in verse 19, in verse 18 to God, right? Okay, God, you want to use me, but listen, Sarah and I already figured it out, okay? I, I got Hagar. She gave me permission to have a child with Hagar, and we have created a vehicle that we want you to use. This is critical. This is critical. He doesn't trust God's ability because why? He does not know God's ability. So what is he doing? He's trying to hand God his own creation, his own abilities, his the own thing that him and his wife concocted and say, God, I need you to just go ahead and use this because there's no way you can use me. My goodness, doesn't that sound like somebody that you may know, namely yourself, that God says he wants to do the impossible out of you, and we don't see how he can do it, so what we want to do is we want to use our own abilities. That's called flesh for some of you that might not know where I'm going this morning. We want to offer our flesh. We want to offer the things that we have created, and we want to give those to God for him to use, and God is not interested in your flesh. He's not interested in your ability because when we continually use flesh, we don't trust God to do the impossible in our lives. I love what the next verse says because verse 19 says this, and God said no. And the reason a lot of us aren't being used by God this morning is because God said no to our flesh. He said no to the things that we want to bring him. He says no to what we want to offer him because he doesn't want to use what we want to offer. He wants to use what he wants to do through us. Oh, my goodness. Somebody's got to hear this. Trust is not developed when I keep offering God my own stuff. It's developed when I don't have nothing to offer him and he used what I didn't know I had. He just creates in me what he wants done. That's when trust is developed. That's important. Look, look at this. And God said, no, but watch what he says. But Sarah, your wife, verse 19, shall bear you a son and you shall call his name Isaac. And he said, I will establish my covenant with him as an everlasting covenant for his offspring after him. So here's what God said to Abraham, right? Abraham, I don't want what you can bring. I am going to give birth in you. I'm going to give birth in Sarah to what I want. And then when that thing is born out of you, I'm going to use that as the vehicle to bless the socks off of you. Go over to chapter 18. Let's keep going. There's a couple more verses I want to show you before we get back to our passage on this morning. Look at chapter 18, right? And jump all the way down to verse 9. Um, a few more reading. This because there's something important I want you to show. So in, in chapter 17, God is speaking to Abraham, and God is promising Abraham what he's going to do. Now in chapter 18, we see now God now going to Sarah. Now watch this. I'm going to read quick because I want to get to one thing. Verse 9, it says, and then they said to him, where is Sarah? In other words, an angel comes back, he encounters Abraham, and he says to him, where's Sarah and, and your wife? And he said in verse eight, 9, she is in the tent. Verse 10, and the Lord said, I will surely return to you about this time next year, and Sarah, your wife, shall have a son. And Sarah was listening in the tent door behind him. Now Abraham and Sarah, it repeats itself, were old Advanced in years, the way of woman, don't miss this, had ceased to be with Sarah. In other words, she was enabled, her womb was closed. She was incapable of reproducing, humanistically speaking, right? Verse 12, so Sarah laughed to herself, um, saying, after I am worn out and my Lord is old, shall I have this pleasure? Verse 13, and the Lord said to Abraham, why Did Sarah laugh and say, shall I indeed bear a child now that I am old? Look at verse 14. God speaking. Is anything too hard for the Lord? And those of you that were in our doctrine of God study, you see that word Lord capitalized. Why? (laughs) Yahweh Elohim. And at the appointed time, I will return to you about this time next year. And Sarah shall have a son. Verse 15 says, But Sarah denied it, saying, I did not laugh, for she was afraid. And he said, no, you did laugh. Look at verse 14. Is anything too hard for the Lord? 
is anything too hard for the Lord, right? What's, what's clear in what I'm reading is I want you to see that Abraham and his wife's faith at this or their trust in God at this juncture in their life is not the same level of faith that we saw in chapter 2, right? And, and, and a lot, uh, chapter 22, and I, I need to flesh that out because I, I'm talking about trust resulting in obedience, but we see Abraham here, and we see ourselves here, not on the same place where Abraham is. And the reason I took us back to see where Abraham begun is because the Abraham you see in chapter 22 was not always here. There was a place where he was on the bottom. There was a time when he was on the bottom and he did not trust God like that, right? And that's my story and that's your story. As we go into 20 and 21, the clarion call is that we trust God. We not trust governments. We not trust People, we don't trust man. Our trust should be in the Lord, right? Here is the, 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 the root scripture, Proverbs 3. Trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not to your own understanding. In all our ways, acknowledge him and he's going to make our paths straight, right? But a lot of us hear that through the lens of Genesis chapter 22, what Abraham did with Isaac. With Isaac. And I want to show you that it, it's okay to be on the bottom when, when God first called us. It's okay to have doubt. It's okay to not know what God says, he, that, that we don't know that God's going to do what God said he's going to do. But it's not okay to say there, even in doubt, listen to this, allow God to be God and let God do what God said he's going to do. Here's what that looked like, right? God might be saying to you, trust me with the tithe. And you might be saying, God, I'm not there yet. I dare you to try, trust him with a dollar. Begin somewhere. I dare you to trust him with 1% and watch how he's going to provide. Trust him with 2% and watch how he's going to be uh, provide, right? God might be saying at this level, give something up. And we don't know what that looks like because we don't trust God like that. Here's what I'm saying to you. Just begin. God might be saying, hey, rid yourself of a sin or give this up in your life. Are you saying, God, I'm not there yet. I am saying to you, trust him by just beginning because it's in the beginning points, we allow God to do what God said he is going to do, and we make room for him to work in our lives. Abraham, when God said, I'm going to give you Isaac, Abraham laughed. He said, I've got my own Ishmael. And listen to this. Abraham had no idea what God could do. And I'm going to say this, and you may not have known this about Abraham. He did not trust God. So the Abraham of chapter 22 of the book of Genesis is not the same Abraham in Genesis chapter 17. He ended up trusting God greatly, but he began with no trust at all. So some of you may be at the place of no trust at all, and God is speaking. Take the risk. Take the risk and watch what God is going to do. Now, interestingly enough, flip over to chapter 21, right? Let me show you something in chapter 21, because this is paramount for the journey. Remember now, Abraham is here. No trust. None whatsoever. God is saying, I'm going to bless you, and he's laughing. <clears throat> How in the world, God, do you think you're ever going to realize this? He's laughing. He doesn't trust God. He doesn't believe God, right? But then in chapter 21, then in chapter 21, look at verse 2. Look at verse 2. And Sarah conceived and bore Abraham a son in his old age at the same time of which God had spoken to him. Abraham called the name of the son who was born to him and whom Sarah bore him. Listen to this, Isaac. And then watch covenant now. And then Abraham now circumcised his son when he was eight days old as God had commanded him. Abraham, listen to the detail, was a hundred years old when his son Isaac was born to him. And Sarah said, God has made laughter for me. Everyone who hears me will laugh over me. 
And she said, who would have said to Abraham that Sarah would nurse children? Yes, yet I have borne him in his old age. Let me slow down. I'm trying to tell you, God released the word over Abraham's life. Abraham doubted God. He had no trust. He had no faith. He had no confidence in God. Then, listen to this. When Sarah ended up pregnant, this is important. Imagine the shift in Abraham's trust. It probably went from zero to maybe five. You're what? Maybe this God is true, right? Then, imagine nine months later, this 90-something-year-old woman who got pregnant from a 100-something-year-old man. Why? Because God released a word in his life when Isaac exited that room and Abraham laid eyes on Isaac. Imagine what that did for his level of faith. It went from a zero to a five, probably to a 99, because here's what he said, my goodness. Nothing really is impossible for God. Then all of a sudden, his trust in God began. Now, why am I saying that? Because I'm sure some of you out there have taken the risk with God, and you may have missed the fact that the moment you trust God, he proves himself faithful. Let those little incremental blessings from God result in your level of trust in God. Make room for him. But then when he does what he says he's going to do and he proves himself faithful, listen to me, increase your trust. Increase your trust. Increase your trust. You got to hear me say that this morning. So, so you've got to understand, no trust in chapter 17, right? Then the baby's born in chapter 21, high level of trust. Now, we're going to get to our text. It's, it's a long way to get to our text, but now we're in Genesis chapter 22. So when you look at chapter 22, and it opens up in verse 1, here's the first verse of verse 1. After these things, listen to this, God tested Abraham. Now, now let's go to work. So watch this. Abraham, I'm going to bless you and give you a child. Sure you will. He didn't trust him. All of a sudden, the child is born. The child now is of age. God shows up again, and to the same Abraham, and now he is testing Abraham's trust, chapter 22. And he says, Abraham, take Isaac. Listen to this. Abraham doesn't laugh. Abraham doesn't doubt. Abraham doesn't question God. The text says he immediately gathers his son and begins the journey. Listen to this. Trust resulting in obedience, but it had to begin somewhere. It had to begin somewhere for Abraham to get there, right? And so look with me now at verse 5, and then we're going to talk to this, right? So now we are at verse 5. This is where we left off last week. So verse 5 says, Abraham begins the journey, right? And then verse 5 said, Then Abraham said to this young man, You stay here with the donkey. I and the boy will now go over there. We will worship, and we will come to you again. For those of you that may not have been with us last week, you got to go to YouTube to hear this. You got to check the message out from last week. God tells him to offer his son as a sacrifice, right? God says to him to go kill your son as a sacrifice to me. Abraham obeys. Three days journey. He gets to the region of Moriah. And here's what he says. Without knowing what God was going to do. Hey servants, you two stay here. Keep the donkey. I'm going to show you some things in a little while. The boy and I are going over here. And we're going to worship. And listen to this. And we're going to return. My question to you this morning is this, right? How in the world did Abraham have a clue that God was not going to let him kill that boy? How in the world did Abraham have a clue that God was even going to give him an opportunity to come back down that mountain with that boy alive? Here is what Abraham had learned about God from chapter 17 to chapter 22. Abraham had learned that he could trust God's word. Hear me. 
he had learned that if God has released a word over your life, God is not a man that he should lie, nor is he the son of man that he should change his mind. Abraham had confidence in God's word. God said it, it's going to happen. God said, my 90-year-old wife is going to get pregnant by this 100-year-old man, and it happened. God said he was going to give my wife a child, and it happened. God said he was going to use me to father the child, and it happened. So Abraham knew that if God spoke it was going to happen. So listen to lesson number one. He learned I can trust God at his word. I don't have time to flesh this out, but I want you to hear me say this morning, you need to learn, number one, that you can trust God at his word. God can be trusted at his word. Here's the second thing Abraham learned about God, right? He learned this, that with God, nothing is impossible. That's important. Don't bring your Ishmaels to God if God is not asking for an Ishmael. Allow him to give birth to an Isaac in you. My goodness, there's a word there for somebody. Quit offering God our raw talents. Quit offering God our natural abilities. Quit offering God the things that we do in the flesh. No, 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 no. Allow him to birth something in you because it's because of the thing that he births in you. That's where the blessing really is, okay? The vehicle of promise is in what God creates in you. It is not what we bring him. Nothing is impossible with God. And Abraham learned that lesson. And then here's the important lesson. Here's the, Abraham learned that any act of obedience is an act of worship with God. If God created the thing in you and God says, worship me with it by offering it to you, if he says, kill it, he has the ability to do it again. You've got to learn that of God. We've got to know that about God. We need to understand God that way. Matter of fact, matter of fact, let me read you this. Let me read you this passage in Hebrews chapter 11. I'm almost done. Y'all be patient with me. Hebrews chapter 11. Listen to verse 17. By faith it says, Abraham, when he was tested, offered up Isaac, and he who had received the promise was in the act of offering up his only son. Verse 18, of whom it was said, through Isaac shall your offering be named. Verse 19, considered that God was able to raise him up from the dead, from which, figuratively speaking, he did raise him up. Here's what Abraham offered. If I can worship God with Isaac, God can create a new Isaac, or better stated, God is able to raise Isaac up. So Abraham left his stuff with those boys, and he walked up the mountain knowing that if I kill Abe, no, no, not if, let me not say if, when I kill Isaac, because God created Isaac, God is able to, to bring Isaac from the dead, and if God said he's going to bless me through Isaac, listen to this, God's going to raise him up, God won't leave him die, and, and there's something there that he's talking about, a foreshadow of what happened on Calvary. If God said he's going to redeem the world through sin, something has to die for the redemption to take place, and some of us can't receive the blessing from God, because refuse to offer him and worship him, listen to this, with what he has created in us. We're trying to offer God Ishmael's, and we're bringing Ishmael's to God, and God is not off asking for Ishmael. He wants the Isaac in you. He wants you to offer it to him on that altar of sacrifice, and listen, that takes trust, and it takes obedience to walk that trust out. I'm hoping you hear me say this this morning because what we see in verse 5 is simply a knowledge of Abraham's trust in God's word. Here's the last thing I want to share. Here's the last thing, number 3. Look at number 3. Look at number 3. Trust resulting in obedience. And y'all have to be patient with me on this one. Means no wiggle room. We're going to pick this up next week. Trust Resulting in obedience means no wiggle room. I'm not going to take much time on this because this is going to mess you up. We had an uh, elder at Restoration Christian Fellowship by the name of Elder Johnny Barnes. And Elder Johnny Barnes was my mentor, and he served on our board. He was a founding or a charter member of Restoration Christian Fellowship. Matter of fact, if you go 
in the foyer of the church over the water fountain on the west wall, you will see a picture of Elder Barnes. And why is this picture there? Because he is a pillar of faith at Restoration Christian Fellowship. Here is Elder Barnes' statement. Whenever we found ourselves in a boardroom and we had to make a tough decision, Elder Barnes would say to me or he would say to Elder Taylor or he would say to whoever's in the boardroom. He had a habit of saying this to me. Hey, pastor, no wiggle room. What do you mean, Elder Barnes, no wiggle room? Here's what Elder Barnes would be trying to say to us. Don't make decisions and make your decision in such a way that you keep a safety net for yourself, right? Because the safety net would be considered wiggle room. So if you're going to obey God, here's what Elder Barnes would say. If you're going to trust God that results in obedience, go all in and eliminate all the wiggle room. Don't leave rooms for you to wiggle yourself in a corner in case God doesn't do what God said he's going to do. Either you trust him and you obey or you don't. So he would say this, no <clears throat> wiggle room, right? Here's what I would look like. Say, say, for example, God says to you, I need you to quit smoking. Here's what we say. Okay, God, but here's what we do. We keep a pack of Winstons in the corner on the shelf just in case we can't handle the temptation no more. Well, that pack of Winstons in the corner or whatever your brand is, that's called wiggle room, right? Or here's what it says. Okay, I'm going to start a diet today. And, and, and the good Lord is saying, go all out. But no, we keep, we keep our favorite snack in the closet or we keep our favorite snack in the back of the fridge, right? Just in case we have a weak moment, we have something to fall back on. Well, that's called wiggle room, right? Or God might be saying to you, change your ways or give this up or give that up, right? And here's what we do. Yes, God, I'm going to change. I'm going to give that up. Uh, but we hang on in our back pocket or in some place that safety net. Well, Elder Barnes would say to you, no wiggle room. So here's what I'm saying. If we're going to trust God that results in obedience, it means that we must eliminate all the wiggle room or have no wiggle room whatsoever. Let me read this and I'm going to stop. Look with me at Genesis chapter 22. Go back to chapter 22. Let me read this real quick. And look at what verse, uh, where is this at? This is good. I want you all to see this. Look at what it says here in verse 6. Look at verse 6. Verse 6. And Abraham took the wood for the burnt offering. And he laid it on Isaac, his son, and he took his hand, in his hand the fire and the knife. Let me read that again. Abraham took the wood of the burnt offering, and he laid it on his son Isaac. And he took in his hand the fire and the knife. Watch this. So they both of them went together, and look at Isaac now, on the way, he said to his father, Hey, my father, he said, Here I am, my son. And he said, Behold the fire and the wood. But where is the lamb for the burnt offering? And Abraham said, God will provide for himself the lamb for the burnt offering, my son. And they went together. Now, I'm done, but here it is. Abraham could have done like me, and he could have done like you. Created wiggle room. All right, I trust God. And when he got to the land of region, he could have said to his boys, hey, you guys stay here. Keep the wood, we won't need that because there won't be no fire. Keep the knife, we don't need that because Isaac ain't going to get killed today. Or keep the fire because we're not going to light it. He could have kept that and him and Isaac could have walked up that mountain with none of those things. That would be considered wiggle room, right? Because here's what, I am going, trusting or hoping that God would deliver me. Elder Barnes would say to you, no wiggle room. Watch Abraham. He left there, oh my goodness, trusting God with everything in him. He was determined to physically kill his son because God said this. So notice what he did. He told the boys, you stay here with the donkey. He took the wood for the fire. Hey, Isaac, you carry the wood. And watch this. And he had the knife in his hand. And he had the fire in his hand. Here's what he says. 
God had asked him to offer Isaac. So every step of the hill, Abraham had absolutely no wiggle room whatsoever. Everything in him said, I'm going to offer this boy as a sacrifice and I'm going to trust God to do whatever God wants to do after I offer him as a sacrifice. My goodness today, that is no wiggle room. I'm going to pick this up next week. And God wants us to go there with him. Quit the reserve stuff. Quit the holding on stuff that we have. Quit the things that we have, the security blankets, no wiggle room. If we're going to trust God in 2021, don't trust God and your political party. Your political party is wiggle room. Don't trust God and your favorite presidential candidate. Your favorite presidential candidate is wiggle room. Don't trust God and your job because trusting God and your job, the job becomes wiggle room. I want y'all to hear me what I'm saying this, this morning. Don't trust God and your spouse, right? Because here's the thing. Those things that we have in conjunction with God, believe it or not, we put it on par with God. And that creates the wiggle room, which is why our trust in God is not resulting in obedience. So here's what this looks like. If we're going to trust God resulting in obedience, it's go hard or go home. My goodness, that's a hard word to begin the year. But if we're going to trust God, go hard or go home. Go all in. We're going to pick this up next week. And we're going to wrap this up and watch what God does when we carry the knife and we carry the fire and we carry the wood when we eliminate all the wiggle room and we go all in for God, you will be amazed at what God is going to do in your life in the year 2021. No wriggle room, baby. Jump all in for God. Bow your heads with me. Father, as your word has gone forth, grow us to trust you like Abraham. Grow us to trust you so that when you speak, it results in obedience without wiggle room. And you get the glory. Have your way, God, in our midst. In your name we pray. Amen. Amen.